and now to share his knowledge, João Azevedo from Shift Forward. Um, hello everyone, I don't know if you can hear me well, yeah, okay. Before I get started, you can use this URL to go through the talk at your own pace. So if I go too fast, you can go back some slides and watch something that you didn't understand that well. Um, my name is João Azevedo, I'm from Shift Forward, and I'm here to present the pros and cons of Scala as a server-side language. Uh, I don't know if that is okay, because it's still blinking red. <laughs> okay, now it's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, how many people here have heard about Scala? <laughs> okay. How many people here have written Scala code? Okay. That's nice. Um, little bit of things about me. I graduated from FIOP in 2010. I worked on a cruise scheduling application for a railway company at Cishkog for a year. I worked mostly with Common Lisp. Then I went to Fraunhofer Portugal, where I, did, uh, where I worked on signal analysis tool and some mobile application development, and I joined the dark side of online advertising technology in 2012. <laughs> um, when I joined Shift Forward, uh, we were already using Scala, so I didn't take part in the decision to start using Scala, but why did Shift Forward choose to use Scala in the first place? <clears throat> First of all, we were looking for a statically typed language. We are strong believers that specifying some program environments at compile time increases development speed in the long term. It leads to less bugs. And we also believe that it removes the need for some classes of tests. You don't need to test for types as you do in some dynamic languages. But we also wanted to have a language with a decent type inference. We didn't want to have that excessive verbosity of specifying a type for every single variable and return value of a function. We also wanted to stick to with uh, JVM because we believe that the platform independence is the deployment of service in different types of environments and the ecosystem is already very rich. There are various libraries and tools that we can use on top of Scala that come from the Java world. And finally, Scala is very powerful with, with regards to concurrency primitives. There's thread-based concurrency that comes from Java. There's also actor-based concurrency which is inspired by Erlang, but I don't think, uh, I think no one barely uses Erlang, so Akka has that available in Scala and Java as well. There are parallel collections and controllable immutability. So I'm going to start listing some of the pros that I believe are more relevant for choosing Scala as a server-side development language, and then I'll end with some of the cons. Uh, one of the first pros is Scala's type system. Uh, Scala solves one problem that Java has for a long time, which is unifying value and reference types. You don't have to deal with that problem that I believe every Java developer has had with, which is dealing with the int value type and the boxed integer reference type. In Scala, all values are instances of a class and all values are objects. Also, the Scala class hierarchy has top and bottom types. That's, that means it's kind of enclosed. There's the any type, everything descends from any, and there's the nothing type, nothing descends from everything. Okay, now I'm going to start showing some Scala code. Uh, this feature, parametric polymorphism, is not very specific to Scala. There are other languages that support it, but I'm going to show this mainly to show some syntax of Scala. So this is the definition of a function in Scala. The def defines a function. The function is named dup. I have here a type parameter. I receive one parameter named x, which is of type t. I, have, I receive another parameter uh, named n, which is of type int and I return a list of t. This basically, what this does is repeat x a number of times and return a list of that elements. You can see here that I don't have return anywhere. This is because in Scala, everything is a statement. So in case of a function, the last evaluated statement will be the return value. Uh, this operator here is the cons operator of lists. So it is basically prepending x to the result of this function call, and nil is an empty list. You may also notice that I have here this Scala prompt. Scala has a REPL. This is also a very nice feature because you can easily experiment and prototype with your ideas before implementing them in uh, Scala files. In the REPL, I have called this loop function with uh, an integer and a string. Notice that I didn't specify the type parameter in either of these function calls, and the return value is correct. This is because Scala has type inference. 
this type inference is very useful because you don't need to explicitly declare uh, types that the compiler can infer for you. For instance, in this function, this identity function, I don't specify the return, the return uh, type because it's obvious it's going to be of type T. Likewise, when I, ass when I uh, um, assign the value of the function call to a variable, I don't need to declare the type of, those, of that variable because I already know the return type of the function call. Um, Scala, uh, Scala also has the notion of functions as types, and functions are first-class citizens in Scala. I don't know if you've been to Francisco's talk, but he already explored this idea. So in here, I have the uh, full function, which is, has two type parameters, and this function accepts a list and a function from A to B. And what this function does is apply F to all elements of list. This pattern is very similar to the other function I showed before. Another thing here is that when I call this function, I declare an anonymous function here. This is also a feature of Scala. This function accepts an int and multiplies that int by two. So if I have a list of with three elements and I multiply each element by two, I get two, four, six. Another nice feature of the Scala type systems are traits. You can think of traits as like Java's interfaces, but with one major difference, which is you can have implementations on traits, which interfaces in Java don't support. In this case, I declare two traits, car and shiny, and I have a class that extends both car and shiny, and I already have this emit brand implemented for BMW because it's implemented in the trait car. Traits are a very nice way to mix in behaviors into classes. Okay, another Scala Pro, at least for server-side development, is the easiness to define domain objects. And why is that? Mainly because of this thing, the case classes. You can think of case classes as something like a class constructor on steroids, because this single declaration bears a lot of things that you get for free uh, in Scala. For instance, if you declare a class like this, which is an user that has an ID of type int, a name of type string, and an age of type int, you can build um, instances of this class without using the new, you automatically have structural equality, which is you can compare instances of type user and it will use the members of the case class for testing equality, and the hash code methods for free. You also have a nice to string method that resembles the structure of the class, and you get pattern matching, which I'm going to, which I'm going to talk uh, further on. Here is a more uh, convoluted example. I have a case class of site. A site, I assume it's a list of users, and the user is the same as I've presented before. So here I have two declarations of, of site. You can see how easy it is to declare a site. Notice that I never use the new keyword, not even on the list. This is because list is also a case class. And I get a nice to string method. See, that resembles the, the pattern I use for creating the object. And even though these sites are two different references, they are equal because they are structurally equal. Everyone following so far? Yep. Okay. Now going to another nice feature of case classes, pattern matching. Um, pattern matching is very useful to um, decompose stuff out of classes and to do something called structural recursion. In this case, I want to define a function that computes the average age of users of a given site. In order to implement this, what I'm going to do is sum the ages of all the users of the site and then divide by the number of users. I declare another function here <coughs> that accepts a list of users. And what I do here is pattern match on this list of users when I do this match here. And when I pattern match, the list can be two things. It can be an empty list, in which case the sum is zero, or it can be a user with something else. In case it is a user, I pattern match it further on the user case, case, case class to extract its age. And then the average each sum of users of a site is going to be the age of that user with the each sum of the other users. Case classes are also very powerful to define algebraic data types. I'm going to define, show an example that uh, models a simplified version, version of JSON using only case classes. Um, basically, JSON is uh, there's a, a top type, which is yes value, and numerous case classes that define different types of JSON. So you have JSON numbers, JSON strings, JSON arrays, and JSON objects. Uh, don't mind this def to JSON string. It's basically the, the string representation of the JSON, but for demonstration purposes, it's not really necessary to, for this presentation. 
Uh, after defining this, notice that whenever I want to create a JSON object, the structure of the constructor resembles very much the structure of the JSON itself. And with this, I can then convert it to JSON because I've implemented these two JSON strings. In this simple few lines of code, I have modeled a simplified version of JSON. I'm going to use this as just an example further on the presentation, so uh, keep this in mind. Okay, uh, now to the, some of the more exoteric parts of Scala. One of the pros that I find very useful in Scala are the concept of monads. This is not specific to Scala, it's a functional programming construct, but Scala takes very much advantage of it. You can think of monads as a way to abstract computations. One easy way to think of monads is as boxes. <coughs> You have two operations associated with monads. One is the unit operation. You have a value of a given type, and you put that value inside a box. That box is now your monad. And then you have a bind operation, which in Scala is called flat map, that picks these boxes of A's, applies a function here that converts each element inside that box of A to a box of B's, and then flattens all those boxes and returns a single box of type B. These two operations are very powerful because they define the kind of uh, higher kind of functions that you can use on different types of monads. And Scala takes advantage of this, and monadic operations are everywhere. The Scala collection has uh, monads on almost all the, the, the data structures that it provides. List is a monad. You can use flat map on lists. In this case, what I'm doing is for each argument of, uh, for each element of the list, I'm returning a new list with minus one, the element in plus one, and I have this. And there's also map, which is a version of flat map that doesn't flatten and instead accepts a function from A to B instead of a function from A to a monad of B. Everything clear so far? So, so. <laughs> oh, basically, what you have to retain is that flat map and map is the glue to all things. Having those two simple operations, you can do a lot of things. For example, if I want to do pairwise multiplication of these lists, I can implement it using flat map over one list and map over another, and then return the multiplier values. These will have these results. This is, in fact, so common that Scala has syntactic sugar for it, which are the four comprehensions. This code is exactly the same one as seen before. These flat maps over this list, maps over this list, and returns the multiplied values. And it has exactly the same, same result. Uh, monads are very powerful because they allow you to define reusable components. As I said before, list is not the, the only monad in the Scala standard library. There are other monads. One uh, very useful is the option monad, which is something that abstracts the notion of, of a value that can have a value or nothing at all. It's a way to encode nulls, for example, in a type safe way. And the try monad which is something that abstracts a computation that can either return successful and a value or through an exception. This is all done in a type safe way. And if you define a function to multiply a number by two, you can use this function to every monad. In here I use the list and I multiply it by two, I multiply the option monad by two, and I multiply the try monad by two. And it works in every one of them. Okay, another pro of Scala are type classes, which are a fancy way to achieve a different kind of polymorphism that I'm going to show later on. But there is some prerequisites for me to explain what type classes are. The first one of it is implicit parameters. This is a notion of, that Scala introduced. You can think of implicit parameters as regular parameters of functions with one specific difference. If you don't supply a permit, uh, an implicit parameter at the time of a function call, the compiler tries to find uh, an implicit value that is declared with a, the matching type of that implicit parameter and supply that to the function call for you. In this example, I have another function that accepts an a, an int, and has a b as an implicit parameter and sums the two. In this case, I call other with a value two, but I didn't supply the implicit parameter, and the compiler is unable to find one, so it doesn't compile. However, if I declare an implicit, per, implicit value of type int, if I then uh, call either with two, it will sum two to the implicit value that it can find in scope, which is this one, and sum five to two, return seven. This is even more powerful because it allows you to implicitly convert types at compile time. Imagine that you have this function double of type v, and it multiplies the number by two, and you try to call this function with a string. This shouldn't compile. 
However, if you supply it with an implicit, an implicit conversion, which basically gets a string and converts it to int, the compiler is able to do the conversion before the function call, supply the converted type into the function double, and return the appropriate uh, result. Everything clear so far? <laughs> this then allows you to implement another type of polymorphism. Um, in here, I have this two JSON function, which has a type parameter. The purpose of this function is to write the JSON representation of the value I supply to this function. However, to do so, I require the existence of an implicit thing that allows me to format this, this value to JSON. What is this thing? It's something I declared here. Let's assume that the JSON format is something that is capable to, given a value, write its JSON representation, and given its JSON representation, return the value. When I call this to JSON in a situation where I have an implicit format available for my type, I'm then able to write a JSON string for that type. This is quite powerful because you can change the behavior of to JSON based on the format that you have implicitly provided. In this case, I declare a JSON format of int where I say how to, from an int, write this JSON value and from this JSON value, how to return an int. And then I'm able to call to JSON with ints. It converts me to the string one, which is the value representation of, of a number in JSON. However, since I don't have here a JSON format for strings, I'm unable to call to JSON with a string. And this is checked at compile time. More implicit uh, trickeries allow you to use these extension methods. And this is very common in Scala. It's used both in our code base and, and non Scala libraries. What we do is, here is extend the type with a given method. The integer type doesn't have a two JSON method, however, I'm able to call it here. How do I do that? I simply declare an implicit conversion from a type which has an implicit JSON format to something that has a two JSON method, this JSON writable. Having this declared, I can then call two JSON on the types that have an implicit format available in scope. In this case, you can see the JSON for the user case class. I haven't implemented here the JSON format for the user class. I'll leave it as an exercise if you want to try, but this will only compile if the JSON format is available in scope. Um, now going to some of the other pros of Scala, the concurrency primitives. Scala has the notion of a future. A uh, future is a way to abstract a computation that returns immediately but whose value may not be available immediately. For instance, you can have an expensive computation that in the end returns two. You have immediately a result, a future of type int, you know the type, but it might not be available at, um, at the time of the call. You then can attach callbacks to that future and do something when the future completes. In this case, I have attached a print line callback, and what this is going to do is when the future completes, a print its result, it's its success of two. Now, using futures is very powerful for our use cases. Um, imagine a use case, which is very common in all advertising industry, that we want to enrich the user information we have based on a, on a request. So we have a request coming, for, coming through the, for the server. We want to fetch some third-party info for that user. We want to fetch some geo details to use it to fetch the income info of this user. And we want to compose that and augment the data we have of that user. As you can see, there are a lot of things here that can be done in parallel. I can fetch the user info I have in the database while I'm fetching the user details. However, I can only fetch the income info once I have the geo details. Likewise, I can only fetch the third party data once I have the user info. But once I have all those three things, I can combine them with the future. And why can I compose this? Because future is a monad. And as such, you can compose uh, the monadic operations. And these lines implement this case. Now, ACA is an implementation of the actor model. You can think of the actor model as a concurrency model, which has actors as its most basic primitive. Actors have an internal state and react upon receiving messages. You can't change a state of an actor internally, but you can send messages to it and it can update its own state or spawn other actors and send messages to other actors. Uh, in order to implement actors, you implement a receive method, which tells you how, uh, what an actor must do upon receiving of, of uh, a given message. In this case, I have declared an actor, and I send him two messages, one of type string and one of type int. In this case, I've coded my receive method to print line a message when I receive a string, and to print line this, uh, this received unknown message. 
in case I receive something else. So you can see here the results. Akka also integrates well with futures because you can reply to sender. There's always this sender reference. So whenever you receive a message, you can reply it with a value to the sender. In this case, I, instead of, of using the exclamation mark, I use the question mark. And what I am expecting is this actor to respond to the message of three. So the actor is going to multiply this by two and return them as a future. What else do we get from ACTA besides being able to define actors? Uh, the message-driven programming, uh, programming model allows you to have asynchronous interfaces. You have supervision strategies that enable you to deal with fault tolerance. You have location transparency. Your code doesn't need to know where each actor is. They can be in different nodes and you don't have to adapt your code for that. And you also have persistency, which enables you to, to recover uh, the state of, uh, of an actor in case of a failure. Um, a parse spark is also a good example of uh, concurrency in Scala because it supplies a primitive which is RDD, which is another monad, and you can do map reduce using the flat map and the map operations that we've seen before applied to monads. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be faster here now. <laughs> there are all the Scala pros, I'm not going to mention them right now, so okay. One Scala con, as you probably have already witnessed, is the learning curve. It's not an easy language. It's quick to start using, but hard to master. People coming from an object-oriented background can quickly start writing object-oriented code in Scala. Um, then you can start applying functional programming to specific isolated places of your code base. And this is normally the way that you use to learn Scala. And then you can build to more uh, functional abstractions that are usually provided by one of those three uh, libraries. Uh, one question that usually arises when using Scala is whether to use an object-oriented or a functional design, and this is also makes part of the learning process. One other Scala con is its compilation times. There is a startup overhead, however, there are incremental, incremental compilations, so this is not really an issue, but still, Scala is slow at compiling. Why? Because it has to do a lot of things. It has to do type inference, it, it needs to, resol to resolve implicits, and the functional idioms, as well as anonymous functions, generate a lot more classes per file than Java. So this excuse for, slack, for slacking off while the code is compiling is very legitimate to use in Scala. The thing is so extreme that there are uh, plugins to play music while the code is compiling <laughs> and to show YouTube videos while the code is compiling. <laughs> um, talking about the build system, we also think that the build system is a big con. People always use SBT, which is, which is named Simple Build Tool, but I think they were being ironic when they named Simple. They tried to make a type-safe uh, programmable build configuration. However, it is over-engineered and convoluted. When you want to, de to define a simple task, you have to know a, a lot of concepts to be able to just do a simple thing. Also, the dependency resolution is very so slow because SBT relies on Ivy, and Ivy is single-threaded and not cached by default. Fortunately, there are alternatives, so things are not that bad. One other thing that is a con of Scala are its IDEs and tooling supports. There are three major IDEs for Scala. IntelliJ IDEA is the most used one. There's Scala IDE for Eclipse. There's Enzyme for the one true editor, Atom, Vim, and Sublime. But the ecosystem is rapidly evolving, so there's been work on the Scala presentation compiler, which is a layer of the Scala compiler that stops at the typer and is able to provide information to the IDEs that they can use for type checking and stuff like that. And the Scala IDE and Enzyme are already using it. IntelliJ has its own plugin. Okay, that's it. I think I made it on time. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one, you mentioned that everything is a class. So I was wondering if there are any performance problems, for example, when using integers. Yes, there are. <laughs> I uh, won't fly. I was wondering, it, since Scala has this powerful type inference, is it does it make uh, optimizations for you under the hood? Yeah, you, don't, you don't box integer if you don't need to, so that's, that's done by the Scala compiler. So my second question was about the implicit parameters. Okay. Uh, 
they seem to be quite dangerous, aren't they? Yes, they are. You need to, to know well when you're using implicits because like, you can easily have an implicit declare that you don't know about and eventually your, your conversion. For example, the, the conversion that I had there from string to int is very dangerous because string is a, is a very common type. But usually you do this with type classes and what you want to use that is for uh, ad hoc polymorphism. And in that case, it's not that dangerous because you, you explicitly declare the implicit there for that sole purpose. Thank you. Um, so the, one of the questions might be answered already, what, which is the scope and lifetime of implicit? And the other question is, uh, I'm not very familiar with Scala, um, are anonymous uh, or the return type of anonymous functions, uh, is it um, uh, automatically determined by the compiler or do you have to declare it? Yeah, if, if the compiler, answering first the last question, if the compiler can infer the return time of the anonymous function, it will and it is automatically defined, otherwise you can always uh, define it explicitly. Uh, regarding the first question, the, the implicit will last for as long as your program lasts. Anyone else? There's another question there. Just two small questions. The first one is regarding testing frameworks. Are they the same as Java or are they specific? Uh, you can use JUnit in Scala. However, people usually don't. There's specs too which is the mostly used one. There's also a, a Scala check, um, but yeah, people normally use the Scala ones, but uh, you can use the Java ones if you want. Okay, thank you. The next one, I think you passed it fast and I would like you to elaborate, please, in the, the, the question between the more functional design and object-oriented. Uh, you want me to go back to that question? And uh, no, I just want to hear your personal opinion. Um, yeah. It depends on the use case. Actually, the, the, the question that arises mostly is whether to use that kind of ad hoc polymorphism or parametric polymorphism. In that case of the JSON conversion, do I need a type that already has the JSON conversion defined, or do I define an implicit conversion and supply that type? Um, it kind of depends on the use case. I tend to prefer ad hoc polymorphism. It's usually done like that on several Scala libraries, so your code base tends to go that way. But yeah. It's, <laughs> Anyone else? No? Then thank you, Joan.